and welcome to the January 13th, 2020 meeting of the Belmont Select Board. I'm Chair Tom Caputo, uh, joined this evening as always by Vice Chair Adam Dash. Good evening. And Select Board Member Roy Epstein. Hello. Good evening. And Patrice Garvin, our Town Administrator. Good evening. So tonight, this evening we have a number of different topics, but I will say this is a less packed agenda than we've had in recent, we, recent weeks. So we will, we will aspire to move through it relatively expeditiously. expeditiously. Uh, as always, we'll start out with a couple of community announcements. So uh, reminders about holiday recycling and trash uh, pickups. So there is a cardboard remaining cardboard drop-off event scheduled for January 25th. It is from 9 to noon at the D DPW Yard, 37 C Street. Uh, please bring your Belmont ID. Uh, it's an opportunity for you to get rid of all of those cardboard boxes from the holidays you're accumulating in your garage. Uh, and then we also have got Christmas tree pickup. This is the last week for Christmas tree pickup. Uh, it's being picked up January the 6th to January the 17th. Uh, Christmas trees must be free of decorations. Trees cannot be in plastic bags or have their stands attached. Wreath and garlands that have wires must be put in town-approved overflow trash bags. Uh, for a quick list, of, quick list of what to put or not put in your recycling cart, lids must be closed. We don't want ribbons or bows, no plastic packaging, no plastic bags, no batteries, no Christmas lights, no clothes, no food, and no diapers. That's the update there. Uh, update from the town clerk. Uh, reminder to everyone to please return your town census as soon as possible. Uh, and ensure that you have your cats and dogs licensed by March the 15th. Those should have all gone out, uh, and you should have those in your mail over the last week or two. Uh, the select board, this group here, is seeking candidates for the Economic Development Committee and the Long-Term Capital Planning Committee. Uh, these are both committees that uh, we recently constituted uh, due to needs uh, believe, we believe within the town for some kind of longer-term planning and focus on economic development. Uh, appointments will be made on February the 3rd at the select board meeting. Uh, we want to see applicants by what day, does it say? Whenever we choose. Whenever we choose, but Friday but, before. But, but certainly we would ask that you get them in by the Friday before the 3rd so that we have a chance to review them. January 28th. January 28th. January 28th. Excellent. And then finally, um, Mystic the Therapy Dog. So this is an interesting one. Uh, we all know how long the winter months can be, so to help us get through them, we are pleased to welcome Mystic. Mystic is a therapy dog, and he's looking for more volunteer opportunities with seniors. You can spend some quality time with Mystic for a quick smile and laugh. Uh, this is a free event that will be on Tuesday, January the 21st at 11 a.m., and Tuesday, a week later, January 28th at 1.15 p.m. It is at the, the Beach Street Center. I can't see the picture, but the dog's really cute. Dog's pretty cute. Any other announcements? No. Okay. And do we have any um, questions or comments from uh, from residents? I will say the only thing we've been receiving a lot of is uh, questions about the recent tax um, assessment and rate. Um, we invited the assessors to come to this meeting. Unfortunately, they were unable to make it, so we've invited them to the February third meeting. Okay. So Some questions time. about taxes could be brought up at that February third meeting. Mostly questions about how assessments are determined. Uh, there was a big um, spike in values for okay. this mm -hmm. year. So, so well, I, I personally it. heard quite a bit about, and I imagine my colleagues have as well. Did, did they confirm for the third? We're still waiting. Okay. okay. I think there'll be an opportunity for us to hear more from the assessors on that process and help to educate the public about, uh, about recent why tax the numbers bills. And why the numbers are what they are. Yeah. Yes. Agreed. Uh, all right, so with that, uh, let's take up our first or a matter of business, which is a proclamation to honor the 100th centennial anniversary of the Women's Club. Pretty exciting milestone. Uh, I think we're joined by some members of uh, the Women's Club, uh, including Wendy Murphy. Uh, only Wendy will come up, but we don't bite. It's okay. Please, yeah, yeah. that would be great. Press the button. Yes, you could they'll turn green and okay. if you could just introduce yourself. That yes, would be great. I'm Wendy Murphy. I'm one of the presidents of the Women's Club. I'm a co-president along with Maria Papadopoulos who couldn't be here tonight. Excellent. Well, we have a proclamation that we would like to uh, uh, read in just a minute, but uh, I think most people in town probably know. But would you like to provide just a sort of brief introduction to the Women's Club and the yeah. various different activities? Yeah, sure. I mean, we, we began as a formal club in 1920. Uh, that's 
why this is our 100th anniversary. Um, we probably most significantly in terms of what the town knows about us is we purchased the 1853 Homer House in 1927 um, to save it basically from destruction. That was the plan back then. Um, we were at one point in time uh, really just a social club and an exclusionary social club. So you had to be female, you had to be married, and I think you had to be Irish. Am I right? <laughs> I think so. Um, that is no longer true. <laughs> And we are very proud to say you don't have to be any of those things, and you can be a guy or anything in the middle. And Adam, of course, is one of our uh, male members, and we're very, very excited that we have a lot increasing year after year, more and more members. Um, and we are not just a social club anymore. We uh, do an awful lot of philanthropic and charitable things for the community and for organizations like HelpUs.org, which is um, a group that donates to the homeless we gather clothing and food for them year, year round. Um, we do a lot of different things, and what we mostly want people to know is that we are welcoming to membership. We want people to come to the house, take a tour of the house, understand more about the history of the house. The, the thing people are surprised to learn is that it has ties to Winslow Homer and Winslow Homer's art. Some of his better known pieces, in fact, um, are of Belmont people and places, and the house in particular. A lot of people don't know that because when he moved here, it was the, the house that he and his family moved to was in West Cambridge because Belmont didn't exist yet. And right after he moved here, um, uh, the area where the house is and the area where he lived became Belmont. So a lot of the artwork that he did even after Belmont became a town, which does depict Belmont, is not well understood as uh, as being tied to Belmont or the Women's Club or the Homer House. So we'd like to encourage people to come to the house and understand how significant the house is, the Women's Club is for saving the house from destruction, and um, you know how hard we work all the time to make sure that that historical connection is made. And one more quick thing, if I may. You know, we started in 1920, which no, not surprisingly was the year of women's suffrage. So women became enfranchised in public life in 1920 and um, earned the right to vote. Uh, the Women's Club has always been very supportive of voting, and even way back then, there are notes in their diaries about how important it was for them to wake up early on voting day and work the polls. And um, it is really in honor of that message that you know we're here today, and, and very, very pleased to, to have you recognize our anniversary because women's rights have come far. Of course, they haven't come far enough. We have the right to vote, but we do not yet have equality under the Constitution. We're still fighting to pass the Equal Rights Amendment. I do a lot of work as an activist academic attorney, and I'm trying to use the Belmont Women's Club to, you know, ravel rouse a little bit about the Equal Rights Amendment. You got to do what you got to do. But I just wanted to emphasize that um, it's still important for women to come together socially, for charitable purposes, for whatever reason, to stay together, and that you know, 100 years is a long time, uh, but it's it's still important and significant to people in town that we exist as a club. Excellent. Well, thank you. We do have a proclamation that Adam has volunteered to read in his best radio voice. Thank you, Tom. Uh, yes. From the town of Belmont, Massachusetts, Select Board, a proclamation. Whereas the Belmont Women's Club was founded in 1920, the same year women won the right to vote and became enfranchised in public life. Whereas the Belmont Women's Club has provided support to the Belmont community through civic and philanthropic programs and activities. Whereas the Belmont Women's Club purchased the 1853 Homer House in 1927 to save it from destruction and redevelopment. Whereas the Homer House is an important part of Belmont's history, and the Belmont Women's Club's members have volunteered their time and resources to maintaining and preserving the house for future generations. Whereas the Belmont Women's Club has generously given scholarships to Belmont High School seniors and donated the use of the Homer House for charitable purposes, including public tours, free lectures, and children's programs. Whereas the Belmont Women's Club in 2010 donated the land to a land trust to protect against future development. Whereas for 100 years, the Belmont Women's Club has demonstrated an unwavering commitment to the preservation of the Homer House and Belmont's history. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the select board of the town of Belmont joins with the town in paying tribute to the success of the Belmont Women's Club. We hereby celebrate and commemorate the centennial anniversary of the Belmont Women's Club on this Monday, January 13, 2020. The Women's Club has set a high standard of commitment and dedication which the youth of our town may follow and serve as an inspiration to the citizens of the town of Belmont. 
January 13th, 2020, Select Board, Thomas Caputo Chair, Adam Dash Vice Chair, Roy Epstein Member. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Thanks, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> do you want to do a photo? Do you want to do a photo? No, over by the oh, fire. Do you want to come, Patrice? Can't not have you. Hundred years, pretty exciting. Yeah, it's a long time. Next, we will take up uh, the acceptance of a donation on behalf of the Belmont Fire Department, and I think Chief Frizzell is here to uh, talk us through this one. As always, you know the drill. If you would introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Chief David Frizzell, your fire chief. Assistant Chief Wayne Haley. Okay, good evening. Um, so from time to time we receive donations for the good work our firefighters do for the residents of the town. And we've recently received two don donations. The first one was actually from the wife and family of firefighter Ronald Gaudet, uh, who was appointed in 1979 and retired in 2008. And he happened to pass uh, last uh, April. So, his, uh, he was a, Ronnie was a long time member of the fire department. I remember him as a kid. He was uh, on my group when I uh, started as a firefighter. Good, dedicated, he was a veteran, um, service to the town, and uh, Ronnie's family asked to, uh, and made a donation uh, to the department. The second one was from a person we had assisted, uh, Mary Louise Isaac, and she, uh, in her card said basically, you know, I'd like you to accept this donation for your brave and caring service. It wasn't a major call, it was actually kind of a minor call, but she really appreciated uh, what the staff had done. We receive many compliments about the service we provide. Um, many of them we can't share with you because of, you know, there may be medical calls, situations that people wouldn't want out in the public. Things like our quarterly satisfaction surveys for EMS excel uh, in all categories and against our other uh, agencies we're compared with. And just to give you a little bit of a gist of uh, some of the letters that we get, the following letter was slightly altered to remove the personal information about the specific medical call to protect the patient's privacy. This is not from either of the donations tonight, but some of the many of the letters re we received. I was actually very proud of. Uh, the members who responded on this call. Uh, and the uh, person wrote, as a longtime Belmont resident, I wanted to be in touch with you. On Thursday evening in December, my m husband took a fall, a bad fall in our driveway. After a while, I was able to get him up and into the house. We were advised by one of your captains, who was, I guess, a friend of theirs, to have the fire department come and check him over, as there was quite a bit of blood and broken glasses. Lieutenant Jeff Harvey, firefighters Mike McNamara, Brian O'Neill, John Carabello, and Mike Nolan arrived and took over and made us feel very comfortable. They checked him over, vitals were all fine, recommended that he go to the hospital. He refused, must be that stubborn male <laughs> factor there, and assured us that if he wasn't well during the evening, they would come back. So, so in addition to taking care of my husband, they brought our groceries in from the trunk, picked up everything that was spilled in the driveway from the fall, spread salt on the ice, in addition found the lenses from his glasses and his hearing aid in the snow. Uh, I wanted to say thank you again and for you just to be aware of how helpful the firefighters were who came to our house that evening. So we would get calls, AO, letters like that. So um, we appreciate what they do. The department has limited ability to use budget money or funds to show its appreciation for the great work for the firefighters. And we started this uh, annual employee appreciation event 
Uh, this fund is, receives donations from like tonight's and uh, I contribute to if we, uh, there's a little bit of a shortfall. We usually have an annual event where we invite all of the active and retired members have something like a cookout. It's good for morale building as well as to hear the stories of the retired members because they always had, just like fishing, they had the bigger fires, they had, you know, <laughs> all those things. So I would ask that the select board accept these donations for the purposes of the fire department's employee appreciation efforts. Thank uh, you for those stories. I think when you're the one making the call, it's not a small call, but. Uh, yeah, no, we, and it, it is amazing when you're actually on the other side and you're calling for help, those seconds seem like minutes and the minutes seem like hours. Well, it's great that people recognize the, yep. the great service you provide. So. Uh, and we thank you for everything you do, and we'll very happily accept these uh, donations on your behalf. I would move to accept the donations from Mrs. Diane Gaudet in the amount of $200 and from Mary Louise Isaac in the amount of $100 for the purpose of funding supplies for the Belmont Fire Department Employee Appreciation Event. A second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, Chief, uh, just to make the obvious explicit, how does one go about making a donation to the fire department? <laughs> uh, it's, you know, the, most of them come through the, the U.S. mail, snail mail, um, just addressed to uh, myself at the fire department and uh, usually with a card or a note that says that they would like to uh, make this donation. If there's a specific reason or something, um, you know, we'll take that in consideration also. And is, it, is the check made out to the town of Belmont? Or the something? check would be made out to the town of Belmont. Sometimes they mistakenly make it out to the Belmont Fire Department, but we can get those cashed as well. So, Okay. Thank you. Excellent. All thank right. you very much. Well, thank you. Just Keep. one other thing, uh, a community announcement. Uh, I was told cradles to crayons. Uh, it's an initiative by both the police and fire departments. So we're accepting donations uh, from now until I think next week. Uh, for infants up to young teenagers um, and it's everything from coats and clothes and things like that so either the uh, fire station on Trafella Road or the temporary police station down at 40 Woodland Street so excellent all right thank you very thank much you very much good, good to night see you. thank you yeah. good to see good you night, So next, we will take up a discussion uh, and possible vote of our traffic calming policy. I think Glenn Clancy will be joining us, and I see members of our uh, Transportation Advisory Committee as well. Uh, Dana, do you want to join as well? Sure, if they would like to join, absolutely. I think this will be a, a good to have the broader context. Evening, Dana. You have to turn your mic on. This has become one of our harder working committees in town. <laughs> it's one of our uh, biggest hot button issues absolutely. in town. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's, exactly, that's exactly Oh, hi, Larry. Right. Good right. evening. Good Members of the committee. So yeah, if, uh, if you would introduce yourselves, please, that would be great. Sure. Um, I'm Dana Miller. I'm the chair of the Transportation Advisory Committee. Larry McDonald, vice chair. And Glenn? Uh, Glenn Clancy, director of community development and staff liaison to the Transportation Advisory Committee. Yeah, and I see other, other, mem other members of the committee. If, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself, we should acknowledge your, your work. Excellent, and we, we, we very much thank you for your service. I also know that this was a, uh, a pretty significant endeavor that you guys have taken on trying to put this traffic common policy in place, so uh, I would love you to kind of walk us through it and uh, uh, give us an understanding of what you'd like us to, to do this evening. Okay, um, so uh, when this committee was formed um, a year ago, um, one of our, the first things we were asked to do is to develop a traffic calming policy for the town. And we've been working on it um, ever since. Um, we work very closely with Glenn Clancy, um, who is the director of community development and the town engineer. We work very closely with Jay Marcotte, who is the director of public works, and with uh, 
James McIsaac, who is now our police chief and with the police department um, in doing this. Um, we started by reviewing traffic calming policies from elsewhere to get our bearings to learn what a traffic calming policy looked like. Um, and there are a lot of them out there on the internet. We were looking for ones that would be from communities most similar to ours so that the policies would be more likely a good fit for our town. Um, and so um, there was a policy in Dedham that we referred to a lot. Um, Lexington has something. Um, Brookline has something. You can look at all these for ideas. And then there are a bunch further afield in Cambridge, of course, and big cities. Um, and those tend to be different. Um, so we worked on this for a long time. We also um, had our um, one of our traffic consultants engaged occasionally with questions um, through Glenn. Um, and then as part of the process, we held a public hearing um, on November 7th at the Beach Street Center. Um, and we tried to promote that to get as much public input as possible. Um, and we took comments and questions and concerns. We heard them all then. Um, we also um, received some direct correspondence. Um, Glenn received emails through an open comment period. Um, and um, we also looked in the newspaper to see what people had written in the newspaper. And we took all of the comments and questions and concerns and um, brought these back to our discussion in the committee. Um, and we amended the policy to reflect a lot of these questions and concerns and updated them. Uh, so um, there have been some concerns um, that the policy did not adequately reflect a commitment to keep residents informed. And we thought we had, but we were very eager to make sure people felt that they were well informed. So we added several new points in the process where the contact would be informed of where the process was for traffic calming. There were also um, some concerns that the process was not sufficiently transparent. And so the committee spent a lot of time talking about how to make it more transparent. And we added several points in the process to make it more transparent. Um, we also are taking a step. Um, Glenn Clancy is going to be maintaining an online listing of all the traffic calming requests that come in um, with an indication of where they are in the process and whether or not uh, the select board has approved them um, and whether or not their uh, traffic calming has been implemented um, yet. And that will be something that people can see from the privacy of their own homes. So this is all done in an effort to make the process transparent and more easily accessible to people. Um, and, uh, and in response to some concerns that seemed to us to reflect confusion, we went back and reworded things a little more carefully to make sure people understood the purpose of the policy um, and um, then um, where there were concerns that um, we didn't include criteria that we had, we made an effort to make those more clearly visible in the process so people would see them. Um, there are also some concerns that were presented that were not necessarily relevant to this policy. Um, some people wanted to speak about concerns they had um, about their streets. And we definitely want to deal with people's concerns about their streets. And we'll do that when they come to the committee through the process. Um, and um, I think that's a general statement of what we've been doing and what we would ask tonight um, is that if we are able to answer your questions and you're comfortable, we would like to have this approved. The full committee um, was unanimous in its vote um, that we would like to have this approved for the town's use to provide for uh, a more easily accessible and transparent process for our residents to access traffic calming. I would like to add that the members of the committee and a couple of others who are not here with us worked very hard. A lot of them did individual research on the internet or elsewhere, brought that information into us so that we could uh, discuss it and insert 
some of those thoughts into the final document. But there was an awful lot of hard work. We met usually twice a month yep. for the past year working on this. And I'll say that, that is cle clearly evident. I think it's a, it's a very thoughtful, uh, thoughtful document. Um, I had a, a handful of questions. I imagine my colleagues yeah. do as well. Um, I don't know, Roy, do you, you, you want to kick off first? Sure. Um, I had a question about just what is, um, well, let me put it this way. In Roman 4, it's called traffic calming methods. Is this, uh, is this supposed to identify the, all of the traffic calming methods that may be considered in response to a traffic calming request, or are these merely examples of possible actions? Because the, the issues that come to mind in light of the whole um, high school uh, traffic uh, study issues inc include one potential one-way restrictions and turning restrictions, and I don't see those listed in the Yeah, this is a uh, very good point. Um, this is not a comprehensive listing. Um, section 4 is meant to explain, generally speaking, what traffic calming is. And so um, there we could have a, a compendium, an appendix at the, at the back that would have, some towns do have color pictures with illustrations of the myriad choices for traffic calming. We wanted to give people a general sense, but we're not here defining all of the choices. Okay. That section, Roy, is a section that you find in a lot of traffic calming policies. It's a pretty standard section. Um, it's really meant to kind of present the context of what um, you could expect uh, for an outcome when traffic calming is determined to be required or necessary on a roadway. But as Dana said, it's not meant to be comprehensive. It also serves to draw a distinction between the traffic calming methods and the regulatory traffic controls, which I think is helpful because I think a lot of people will conflate the two in terms of saying, hey, put a stop sign in there, that'll solve the problem, and that's, that's not part of traffic calming. You were very clear, and I thought that was really helpful, like what you included and, why, and what you didn't include and explaining why you didn't include certain things. I had questions and I was reading, I'm like, I didn't have any question anymore because it was very clearly yeah. in there. So. That's do you have some questions? As Roy's done. I don't know. No, I, I thought it was also helpful to draw the distinction between town-owned roadways and private ways, but that might be made a little more, um, maybe brought out more clearly, but I, I'm glad it's, that clarification is in the document. Great. Good. Yeah, I thought this was great work. I thought it was a, this is a sort of a politics-free, data-driven way to evaluate issues with the roadways and the sidewalks and such in town. It's very clear, it's a very specific process. It's honestly exactly what I was hoping for when your, cre when your committee was created, so good job. Um, I had a couple of comments on um, probably more questions and as soon as I ask them, I'll probably you'll answer them. But the, in uh, three, you have a whole series under the traffic calming request, the process steps. You know, like steps 11, 12, it talks about, we'll notify the request contact What's a request contact? So on the form at the end of the policy, um, this number two says your name, and then in friends it says request contact you. Yeah, I just wonder if it's really called applicant or something simpler. We can do that. that. I mean, I, I it's think sort of a just awkward wording. I kind, I kind of assume that's what you meant, but I you know, requestor or applicant I or think something like that. what you were trying to do, that if we had several applicants from a, a certain street or a neighborhood, that a single person will be designated as, as the, the contact, contact oh, okay. All right, well, right, fair, then right. you answer my question. Because a request requires a number of uh, people involved, right? Yes. Sure. And yet for the purposes of the town communicating with them, it's impractical to expect the town to communicate right. with all of the people who have signed. Yeah. Right, the, the fair, that, that, that perfectly okay. explains it. Um, on uh, 6, uh, Roman numeral 6, <coughs> about the... Um, for each request, a completed traffic calming request form must be submitted with signatures ex with five different streets, all this 50%. Could we exempt the town boards and departments from that requirement? It would seem to having the town boards going around getting neighborhood signatures maybe not maybe yes, overkill. Yes, I think we can make that explicit. And, and you said that was? Uh, Roman numeral six. Yeah, yeah, okay. Whereas the A and B, the things that you have to get 50% of the abutters yeah. and all that, I don't, I don't know if the a town department is requesting it, it something. It was not our intent really to do that. Right. Yeah. yeah, some of that is exempted and the process outlined above does not apply to, and you list a few things. Yeah, I saw that. Down, but I guess to your, to your point, there could be so a high school building committee or something that might want to 
right. make a request like that. Um, and could, could I also just ask on, yeah, on that, just, just to pick up on, on the same uh, question? Um, it seemed like a reasonable number of five, um, but I could also see an argument maybe that should be higher. Uh, what was the was the was Were you there spying a, on the transportation advisory committee meetings? I was lurking in the back the whole time. <laughs> we we must have spent I don't know hours talking about this very issue. The right threshold. Yeah. I'm sure there's no right answer per se, but I'd love to understand the logic or the. Oh, well, I, think, I think that. one of the things that the committee um, sort of adopted along the way was the idea that, you know, this is a first for Belmont. I mean, this is something that we're eager to implement, see how it works out, and if we find that there are things that need to be tweaked, um, you know, I think someone will be back before the board to ask for clarification or an update or an edit. Um, as Dana said, there, there was a lot of conversation around this very issue of where that proper threshold is. Do you measure it block to block? Do you look at the entire length of a roadway? That could be several blocks. Uh, what if it's a road that only has five houses on it? Well, believe me, the conversation was very deep and it was very broad. Um, and so I think the idea is this was the best guess that the committee felt to come out of the gate with. And if it seems as though it's, it's not getting, <coughs> getting us where we need to be, we'll, we'll uh, amend it. So in Roman 6, it, it identifies town residents. So any resident can put a request in for any street in the town. Yes. And then those who own who own town own or work in town businesses. Mm -hmm. So that's anybody who has a business in Belmont. Anybody who works here, yeah. Uh, um, and what's then what's in the butter of a town-owned street? So we have properties um, that abut Cambridge and where one half of the street belongs to Belmont and the other half of the street belongs to Cambridge, ah. for instance. And they might have reason to have concern with our streets. I think that's, I think you've captured Thank almost you anyone who could probably ap want to apply at that point. Um, but again, this could be, I mean, as with all these documents we do, they're all living documents. I mean, if, right. if things need to be amended, we've been pretty free to do that as circumstances arise. Did you have additional questions? No, actually, I think that was, I, I'm very impressed with the work here. Uh, clearly well done and well thought through. And I think this is a, sets enough of a bar so that you're not going to get inundated with, you know, one person having a concern that no one else shares versus ha not setting the bar so high that your people will feel like they can't apply at all. Yep. So I think this sort of threads that needle really nicely. So I had a, a couple additional requests. So we talked about the traffic calming needs assessment report. Is that something that's prepared by staff, or is that something we typically look to consultants to prepare? And what is the cost of that? Um, that is prepared by the town engineer. Okay. Uh, so presently, is that a week's worth of work? Is that would be me. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I serve at your pleasure in case yeah, you weren't aware of that. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you, Glenn. Is that maybe it's at Patrice's place? Uh, yeah. Okay. okay. Um, <laughs> is that a, is there is that a day's worth of work? Is that a week's worth of work? What's the rough sense? So I, I don't have a clear answer on that yet. Um, what I will tell you is that um, as this process was wrapping up, um, you know, word started to trickle out in the community that the, that the policy was very close. Um, we had a couple of uh, neighborhoods in Belmont, uh, Rutledge Road, Village Hall Road, come to mind. Uh, where they have had issues with uh, traffic concerns. And uh, the committee and I felt that this is a great opportunity to begin to apply the policy to those neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So we've already started to do it with the hope that the select board ultimately would adopt this and we would just continue running with the policy and applying it to those neighborhoods. Um, so we've done the initial steps. We've, the Belmont Police Department has done the traffic counts and the volume, the volume and uh, we've done the accident data um, research and all of that good stuff. I haven't actually sat down, and both of the roads have met one of the three criteria that kicks you to the next level. Um, what I have not done is actually sit and do uh, the assessment. Okay. Um, my guess is, yeah, you know, depending on how long it takes to pull together some of that data, I mean, to actually sit down and write it, I'm expecting it's probably no more than a couple of hours, maybe three hours of work. Um, I don't know what additional data I'm going to need and who I'm going to need to get it from. That may extend that timeline a little bit. But a lot of this for me in, my, in, in kind of my process and how I go about things is I'm always thinking about ultimately what's going to end up on the page. 
And so I may be pulling things together and, and thinking about certain things. When I sit down and actually write a report like that, a lot of it will have already been sorted out in my mind and it's a matter of getting it down on paper. So um, I don't think it's going to be long, a long process. I don't think it's going to be very time consuming. Um, of course, what I don't know is, because I haven't experienced yet, is how the committee receives the report. Right. Uh, they may look at it and say, Glenn, this is really great. Go back and do it again. <laughs> you know? yep. I don't know. I don't know. Um, but I'm not expecting it to be um, too difficult. Okay. Good. So I, I, my only concern was that there was a substantial cost associated with these, but it sounds like there's a burden for sure in a non-trivial one, but it's something that at least, depending upon the volume, potentially could be managed out right. of the office right now. That's right. Okay. Uh, I take it then when a recommendation, when, when a specific traffic calming recommendation is made, uh, that could come with a variety of provisions like a sunset provision or some probationary period or are they, is it always I permanent or how Well, does that work? I, I think it's, it's going to be case sensitive. I think it's going to be based on the specific problem that we're trying to solve. Um, so far, what we're finding with the data that we've collected, we, we Belmont Police has done um, traffic counting on, I believe, five or six roads so far. What we're finding is um, speeding is not the problem. It's, it's volume. Yeah. And it's cut through volume. And so you know, the, the remedy to that is usually some kind of um, access restriction, probably during peak hour, whether it's morning or afternoon. The data bears out what the appropriate remedy is. Um, I would expect in a case like that that, that sign, a sign package would go up and it would remain. Uh, and it would re remain until such time as somebody who probably lives on that street determines that the signs are no longer required. Um, it's hard to believe that a, a Rutledge Road, for example, it's hard to believe that a Rutledge Road is ever going to experience less traffic than it's experiencing right now just based on what we know about traffic and how it's impacting the region and the expected growth in the volume of traffic. Mm -hmm. Um, where it gets a little bit um, dicey and conversations that Dana and I have had with Patrice um, are, are roads that have been determined to have speeding issues. Speeding issues are going to require something beyond just a simple sign, obviously. There's going to be some kind of a physical um, element that would be introduced to that roadway, whether it's raised tables, whether it's some kind of a curb extension or some kind of an element to uh, try to slow traffic down. There's obviously a cost associated with installing something like that. Um, there is sort of couched language in the policy that recognizes that the town just may not have it within a, a particular budget cycle to be able to fund some things. You'll be on a prioritized list and when the funding becomes available, we'll, we'll address issues as, um, as we can. Um, you know, those elements, I mean, those are permanent elements. My sense, Roy, is, is that once something like that gets installed and if they are effective, uh, the residents are going to want them to remain because, be, be, but just well, by virtue of the fact that they are effective. Yeah, I, this is a little bit speculative now, but it, in the last bullet on um, at the end of Roman Nine, it says in the rec the recommendations include um, trying to anticipate whether traffic would seek alternative routes to avoid the traffic calming. So, if a problem was being removed from one area and pushed on to another area, that's... Sure, so the, the, the purpose of that statement is, for example, if we did introduce a turn restriction on a roadway between 7 and 9 a.m., um, <coughs> if there's traffic trying to get down that road, where are they gonna go? Where are we directing them to go? Um, I'll use Rutledge Road again as an example because it's a nice, clean example. If you're coming out of Arlington in the morning um, and you're on Park Avenue and you decide that you want to cut down Rutledge Road, um, if we take that move away from you, you've got no other alternative. You're going down to the Rotary at, at uh, Prospect Street and you're continuing down Belmont Hill. That's a very nice, very clean um, example of how to apply this stuff. Some of them may not be so neat. Some of them may actually have an alternative where you can't take this left, but the very next street may be an alternative, in which case it's my responsibility to flag that for the committee and the committee would ultimately decide how to remedy that. Maybe, maybe it means a ripple effect of restrictions if the, if, the prob, um, if the problem is acute enough. We don't know, as you said, it's kind of hypothetical. Okay. <clears throat> so two follow-up questions about the prioritization. So uh, essentially as things are approved, projects are approved, they go on the prioritization list. Based upon the scoring, they'll have a relative position. Mm -hmm. unless, it's, unless it's an easy, affordable remedy like signage. 
That is something that we would knock out immediately. There, was, there would be no need to prioritize something like that because it's a relatively cost-effective fix. I guess that was a little bit my question, right? I could see a relatively expensive project kind of mm -hmm. being somewhere in that list and then lots of smaller things ending up getting prioritized below it. Right. Whereas for $3,000, you could make a big impact upon a, a road on a particular section of town, whereas this 40000 50000 maybe $100,000 project is right. blocking it. Right. right. Are we, do we have an approach to kind of bump those things up? Or? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so, I mean, I think there's, there is the, the policy provides uh, for the likelihood that um, the prioritization of the projects will change as new projects are approved. Um, and so that was a concern that people would be confused about that. And so we made that language more explicit. The, the, the people should expect that um, while uh, a project has, has maybe uh, the third spot on the list right now, if something comes in three months later, it may in fact take the second spot and they may be pushed down yeah. to the fourth. Um, and that's a, a factor of, of, of several things, including budgetary constraints in the town. So I think that's a reality. I think it's good that you called it out. I think that will be a little bit hard for some applicants to accept. Like, oh, my project got approved. Great. It's second in line. And then all of a sudden it keeps getting pushed down and pushed right. down. Other things yeah. keep bubbling up. So I think we'll have to figure out how that works. I guess my bigger concern was just about the language suggesting a prioritization. Maybe if a very large project may block the implementation of projects further down the list, but are much more cost effective and much easier. Right. Yeah. Do you understand what I'm getting at? I so do. There's, absolutely. There's a $100,000 project we can't fund right now. Yeah. And there's three smaller ones down below, maybe we should bump those three up, get them right. done. So I, I, and I, and I think the wording gives us the latitude to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that we recognize here is, um, you know, there may be a pavement management project that's in the queue that could address one of these traffic calming issues. Um, priority, priority, prioritization wise, maybe that project is say fourth on a list, but because it happens to fall on a road that we're reconstructing, we would certainly grab that project at number four and knock it out when we rebuild the road. So that's, I, th I mean, I think a common sense makes, a, makes, uh, makes sense. I think the challenge may be, you know, the people who then are in project position three, you're like, well, wait a minute, why'd you do four? So I think we'll have to see how this evolves, but I think that may be where it gets a little bit thorny, mm -hmm. but I think applying uh, some common sense is, is appropriate. And, and a related question. If you got a microphone. If you wouldn't mind, could you just oh, speak sorry. speak to the microphone here, or, or go to the one with the yeah. Yeah. Uh, yep. My name is Chip Gaysunas. I'm a member of the TAC. Um, the question's been raised about the priority list of projects, and so uh, my related question is, um, you know, who kind of owns that? Because the goal of the the process is for TAC to make recommendations to the select board on which projects we think uh, rise to the level that they should be addressed by the town. Um, they go on this priority list of projects, understanding that the town may still not have the resources to address all the projects that we'd like to make a priority. Um, and so I guess my question specifically is, who owns that priority list of projects? Is it the town engineer? Is it the select board? Because at that point, TAC has made its recommendation to the select board, and it's really not our list of projects anymore, I don't believe. Right, and to some degree, we then have to approve those projects. Mm -hmm. So I would Correct. say, you know, my uh, thought is it's probably ours and it's probably ultimately the town engineers to maintain. Right. Um, maybe to that end, maybe we're the group also that can elevate something outside of its priority for, for execution if it, if it makes sense, mm -hmm. take things out of priority. And to the, ex to the extent that budgetary considerations, for instance, right. are, are a factor, that would be something that yep. the town the select board would need to address. I, I, I agree that ultimately I probably has to be a select board decision, but I expect we would rely heavily on the advice of the town engineer. Mm -hmm. and, and on TAC as we have in the past with prior recommendations. <laughs> well, and what I think is also great here is there is some objective scoring that yep. gives it a relative position. So mm -hmm. it's not necessarily about us saying, well, that one looks a little bit better than that one. Right. It's there is a process and it's yeah, going to be apples to apples comparison. No, it's, it's, all, it's all good stuff. No, yeah, this and, is and I think it's really good. As, as uh, stated in the policy, there could potentially be capital budget implications as well. Mm -hmm. So there would yeah. be conversations with myself and the town administrator 
um, if we thought that there was a project that we should try to chase funding through capital budget, um, you know, that would ultimately bring it to town meeting for their approval too. Great. And then my final question was just, if it turns out a project is more about regulatory traffic controls than traffic calming, where do those go? If it's deemed to be more about regulatory traffic control, do you so that out? Regulatory matters are brought to my attention to the traffic division of the police department all the time. Um, I would go through analysis on those requests are the manual and uniform traffic control devices, which is the federal document that the Commonwealth has adopted. Um, if, if it makes sense that there's something regulatory that can be done, we would pursue it. Four-way stop intersections, for example, um, I have brought a fair share of four-way stop approaches before the board over the years um, based on evaluations that I have done using the guidance in that manual. Um, other times, um, depending on the magnitude or perhaps the data that I felt was necessary, I might hire an outside consultant to do the data gathering and write a report. Um, and, and I think the process here would be the same. If, if it's regulatory in nature and it's something that we can address in-house as the town engineer, I would approach it that way. If I felt I needed uh, you know, support or I needed um, a different set of eyes, you know, it's probably something that I would refer to a traffic consultant to, to look at. And will that go through TAC? Um, yeah, more than likely. More than likely it would go through TAC. Um, you know, if for no other reason, you know, one of the things I like about TAC is it's a venue. Yeah. It's a venue um, to be able to coordinate public input. And so um, it's very likely that something <coughs> regulatory is we're going to want to solicit resident feedback. The Transportation Advisory Committee process and that venue is the perfect place to do that. Um, and then obviously, you know, if, if you can get consensus, there's a recommendation made to the board. So now, now that regulatory change that you're looking to make has the force of the committee's recommendation behind it, ultimately, you know, a select board approval. Yeah, makes sense. Well, I want to open it up for public comment. If anybody would like to speak to this. I don't see any. Uh, with that, then, I guess I will look to my colleagues to see whether or not we have a motion. Yeah, I would. I would move to adopt the, the traffic calming policy as presented to us by the Transportation Advisory Committee with the one proviso that I want to clarify in number six, that the town boards and town departments are exempt from the gathering and signature provision. Uh, second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So thank you very much. We appreciate all the hard work, and I think awesome. this is a great step forward to, towards traffic calming in Belmont. Yeah, we have a traffic calming policy for the first time in <laughs> town history. Thank <laughs> you so much for your work thank on you this. Thank you very much. Thank you all. We'll oh. find something else for you to do. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big win. Okay, I think we've now got back-to-back -back 5K race requests. Uh, the first on the agenda. Oh, uh, is that? Skip the, skip the uh, skip. Grand Lodge? No, the update on the service impact. What is it? Yeah, oh. We updated the agenda. Oh, I'm sorry, you updated the agenda, yeah. yeah. Oh. That's not in the menu. It's not in the book. So I'm sorry, you gave, is there an updated agenda? Yeah. Thank you very much. So we will then have update on service impact from the potential McLean development. I think this provides some continuity with Glenn, so you can get out of here, right? That's great. Okay, so this is um, some of this I touched upon in my town administrative report, but yep. given some of the recent developments, I thought we should pull it out and have it as an agenda item. So as um, you're aware, the planning board is going to be taking up the McLean property um, on at their January 21st uh, meeting to discuss with the developer the plans for that, um, that area, zone three. Mm -hmm. as it's commonly known. So one of the things we're hearing in the community is impact of services and what that potential impact would be. There's been in the past, obviously before my time, um, some developments in town. Acorn Park, is that right? Or is it Royal Belmont or is it Uplands? Same thing. thing. Acorn Park <laughs> slash Belmont Uplands slash Belmont Royal or Royal, Royal Belmont. Belmont. Yeah. <laughs> so there's Pick that development. Poison. There's Christian Square that will be coming online next year. So we're hearing a lot of concerns from people that impact on services is a big, um, a big thing and it needs to be kind of fleshed out before this goes potentially to town meeting, mm -hmm. if it ends up at town meeting. Mm -hmm. So 
we had a conversation, Glenn and I, and Jeffrey Wheeler with Jack Jolly and a demographer on Friday. His name is Jerry McGibbons. It, he is the same demographer that did the school study that... Who, for the record, has nailed it for the last five years and actually does exceptionally good work. Yes, he did the 2016 study of the yeah. school to um, discuss you know, growth in the school district and things like that. So he already has a lot of the data, um, and we would like to engage him, write a scope of services, to potentially do some work for us to kind of help us with what the potential impact of this development could be. I think we need to know that town meeting needs to know that. I mean, obviously, that that's a big, you know, people, they can make the decision whether, you know, if you're adding affordable units and it brings more children in, maybe that's okay to get more affordability or maybe it's not. I, it's a value judgment at some point, but without the data, there's no way of knowing. How much are we talking? Uh, between six to 7,000. Right. How, much, how much time does he need to do a report? So I asked that question, mm. and he said by the end of March he should have some he'll be able to come to the board and, and give a presentation. So the McLean would be on the springtime meeting then? Yeah, yes. At, 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 or the earliest, obviously. Did I miss anything? Can you give us that call? Um, no. Because there was talk so about we'll maybe a March special town meeting, but yes. if they're not going to get done with that, then you I don't think we'll be able to get this type of information out before March. Yeah, no, I don't see how And Jack possible. was on the phone and when he heard that date, so I'm assuming he realizes that well. it could be a crunch. Yeah. And Will um, McGibbons, I'm sorry, what was it? It's is it McGibbons? McGibbons. McGibbons, yeah. Will they be also looking at cost of service for other things beyond just the schools? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Okay, so they'll be thinking about fire, mm -hmm. police, all the other absolutely. services, trash, yeah. et cetera. Right. So like I said, we have to write up a scope yep. of service, and we're going to include all impacts to the town, public okay. safety, schools. And revenues. Oh. Well, that, that, but that's the assessor, not an outside consultant at that point. Right. Right. But, we, but we would need that information. Yeah, we, we yeah. could get that. Um, what's the other thing? Oh, the other thing is I know um, there's been a lot of discussion in the community. Um, we've been hesitant to put anything out there publicly only because we don't have the information. So we're trying to gather the information. We're trying to get to the 21st planning board meeting. We want to know what those issues are. Um, we feel that a lot of issues will come to the, to the table that night and we'd be able to kind of address them going forward. Okay. That's the planning board's uh, role. So, so I, again, the, the McGibbons individual, that group, um, did, I know, a lot of the predictions that the schools have used around enrollment, and as I alluded to before, has actually done a very, very good job. I know them historically as sort of education demographers. Uh, are they comfortable with this cost yeah. of service and factoring in other things? Yeah, I, he before? knew what we were trying to get to. Okay. And what, I mean, he has most of the data for the town. Yeah. To start off, so yeah, it was it was a it was a pretty instructive conversation. Yeah, we that we, it was a conference call, <laughs> Teresa and I and Jeffrey, as she said, um, as Patrice said, we were on our end of it, and uh, his ability to quickly reach information and, and convey it. I mean, he's clearly very well versed with Belmont, and the and the demographics in the town. Yeah, um, and so yeah, we all I think we all felt really good when we hung up the phone. We really felt like we had found the person that we needed. Um, to get that information because we're sensitive to the to the fact that the community you know obviously wants this fully vetted they want they want to make sure that we have these questions answered um, and, and I think we felt really good that we had found the person that was gonna get that piece of the puzzle for us yeah and he's he seemed to think the end of March was um, doable for him so that works with our that spring. was with a little cajoling by your town administrator <laughs> yeah. right away. But she's so good at that now. <laughs> <laughs> But I think this sounds like a, something I would support. Do you need a vote? I, I, do you no, know, I, no. Well, I mean, it sounds like it's within so your budget. So have we decided are we using your budget or mine to pay for it? I don't think we have decided. <laughs> no, we've decided that offline. You can yeah. split it. Yeah. But I think yes. you, know, you have our, I mean, you have my support. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, very, I very much think okay, this makes great. sense, and I think it's part of the vetting process for this okay. Zone 3 work. So, But, but, we, but we do need to discuss maybe separately how the assessor is going to approach this, or what we're looking for from the assessor. Yeah, on the revenue side. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, yep. Yeah. There's also the building permit side. Yeah, but the town meeting, we have all this information, and then the town meeting will have to okay. make a decision. Yeah. So yep. Great. Excellent. Okay. Excellent. Right. Thank all you right. very Thanks much. Guys. Thank you, Glenn. All right. Thank you all. Enjoy the, rest of your Enjoy the game.
All right, so we're on to our two 5Ks. So the first is uh, from the Grand Lodge of Massachusetts Sons and Daughters of America, and I think we're looking to do a 5K on April the 19th. I imagine we have some representative. Excellent. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kathy Young. I'm the state orator for the Order of Sons of Italy of America, Massachusetts Grand Lodge, also co-chair of this race. <coughs> so uh, we're trying to rebrand ourselves you know, 20 years ago, we had 20,000 members. We're down to about seven. So we're like, how do we let everybody know what we do as, as Italians? And some of our charities are autism, Alzheimer's, coolies, anemia, uh, scholarships. Um, but how do we let people know who we are and what we do? And so we want to outreach to other people to let us know and maybe increase our membership. Uh, we were at our council meeting, and one of our younger, newer uh, council members said, why are we looking at other places? Why are we not in Belmont? You know, we're located in Belmont. We should be using it. That should be our first step is reaching out to Belmont to let me, us, uh, everybody know who we are. So I was very excited because he is. it was our first meeting. He's a lot younger than me <laughs> coming up with this idea. So I said, okay, let's, let's go for it and let's be in Belmont. We're literally half a mile down, 83 Concord. I'm not from Belmont, so I don't really know the total distance. So uh, we thought it would be a great place to um, give exposure to our order. Um, we do a lot in our, all of our communities. Our affiliate lodges do a lot in their communities, soccer, hockey, basketball, you name it. We're always giving money, and that's our whole goal is to raise money and give back to our communities. So that's why we decided to go with Belmont and uh, start here and, and uh, get an outreach of who our, our Italian, what our Italian heritage is all about. So. That's great. I mean, so. I think we've been looking for more interaction with the Sons of Italy uh, um, over time since that whole CPA project came mm -hmm. up. So it's, it's good to see uh, some fruit come out of that. I saw this is your first year running this. How many runners do you expect to have? In the we're hoping between two and 300. Um, we're, we're dealing with a company called Racewire, which I know they've done races here before. It's our first time with them. So it's all new to us. Uh, years ago, one of our members used to do a walk. And so, um, again, we're trying to not just keep going to our members who are membership average age might be about 75 so we're really trying to get this younger group in um, to come in uh, start building us back up to where we should be um, we're we were excited I was like he's again like maybe 26 27 years old so it was Great. Really worked hard to get him on our council, and then when he came up with this idea, I'm like, "This is brilliant!" And maybe we can do a house, you know, a, a housewarming party or something, um, because we now have a little museum that Belmont has helped facilitate to get us monies for our museum in our lodge, our Grand Lodge. Um, so, an open house would be great. Yeah, I, great. I, I, again, I haven't talked to our historical. Um, Commissioner of Historical and Italian Heritage, um, but it was something as we were talking, you know, as you leave a meeting and you go somewhere and you're talking about what's going on and how can we enhance it, sort of like, well, we should do something with it and show who we are. So oh, we're the oldest Italian, oldest and largest Italian organization in this country. We've oh. been around for over 100 years. It was actually started in New Jersey back, I forgot what actually year it was, but... And we have 44 lodges in the Commonwealth. So yeah, nice. we just got a new lodge in the North End. So I was really excited uh, to bring our... appropriate location. It was. <laughs> it was. It's been a few years. And so we finally um, have a new lodge. So we're, we're excited to be here in Belmont and um, show Sons of Italy and also showcase Belmont. Yeah. One thing I would note for this and for the next one is to do a uh, call, an electronic call to the butters to let them know that the sure. race is happening. And we've done that in the past because I know I've had trouble. I, I'm, I've got to be somewhere, and I go to get my car out of the driveway, and then there's runners going down my street because yeah. I didn't know that was right. a race day. And if I'd known, I would have moved my car. So I think it's important to tell people. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. I mean, it's not necessarily your responsibility, but I mean, because we can target that. But no, I but I think we all. should be part, you know, part of letting our neighbors yeah, know should, as well. You know, and, and it's good publicity for you. So yeah. um, Absolutely. Yeah. I have a question for Patrice. Um, in events of this nature, when there's a police detail, who pays for the police detail? We do. Yeah, the applicant pays. Okay. 
So it looks like there, there is a request for the organizers to follow up with the police to work out the specifics of the detail. Have yes. The, have the police approved the route or? Yeah, the police approved the initial application, but as, the, as it gets closer, they'll work with them a little bit more. Okay. I, I plan on um, reaching out to them this week because we have our board meeting on Friday and I want to make sure that I have everything for our, our council to be able to approve or to give final approval. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. All right, well, welcome. Thank yeah. you. Um, We're excited. I would move to approve the request from the Grand Lodge of Massachusetts Sons and Daughters to host a 5K race in Belmont on Sunday, April 19, 2020 at 10 a.m. The organizers requested to contact Sergeant Kim Hurley of the Belmont Police Department on or before April 5th, 2020 to make arrangements for police details. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you so very, Thank much. You very much. I Good hope luck. to see you that day and we're always open to new members. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Our, our next 5K, Becca is back. Please uh, feel, feel free if you want to join us up here. You're more than welcome to. Your annual visit. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Year five. five. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Great. So once again, if you would introduce yourself, that would be great. And uh, tell us a little bit about the plans for this year. Sure. So I'm Becca Peasy and fifth annual Becca Peasy 5K race director. Um, last year we brought in $30,000 for entirely for the Belmont High School. And um, great, like the race director of the Boston Marathon came and uh, Will Brownsberger, and it was a, just a great turnout. Great. Um, I'm feeling we're a month ahead of schedule this year, so <laughs> I feel like it's, we'll, we'll expect about 500 about. Uh, I start, like, stopping advertising at 500. Um, I think it's a good number. Yeah. But it's been really successful, great way for me to give back to the community. Um, and April 26, I've reached out to Kim Hurley, and um, she'll handle the police detail. We pay for that out of our race. Well, this is easy because we've done this for yeah, multiple years, and you, you run a good race, and there's really Thanks. nothing more to say. Thanks, <laughs> is it the same route this year? Same route, same so it won't be um, affected by the construction. Yep. Yeah, so I see that Bill Avalo and the uh, weighed in from the committee, so that's good to know. Mm -hmm. So is it just 5K, or is it also? 5K and a kid's one mile, so up to one mile. They can do one lap, or but 150 kids ran last year, so that was 50 more than we were expecting, but we're expecting 200 this year, so. Excellent. So bring your kids. Yeah, bring kids, families. Great. All right, well, looks good. Um, I would move to approve the request from Rebecca Peasy to host the Becca Peasy 5K Road Race and the One Mile Kids Run on Sunday, April 26, 2020. The organizers requested to contact Sergeant Kim Hurley of the Belmont Police Department on or before April 12, 2020 to make arrangements for police details. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you again. Yeah, Thanks. Good luck. Thank you for doing the race. Of course, I love it. It's great. Bye. All right, we have our annual, next up is our annual designation of our animal control officer. I still don't quite know why we need to do this every year. It's a state requirement. But so be it. How's it going with the animal control oh, officer? Oh, she's great. She's, she's great. She's out there. She's doing a great job. Oh. Very visible. Sounds she's good. What we like. yeah, well, it's it all looks to be in order. It looked like it was in order to be, so yeah. I, yep. I moved to approve Suzanne. Yeah. Chris Savage is the designated animal control officer for the town of Belmont for the calendar year of 2020. Is she, is she full time? Yes. Okay. Uh, second. All in favor? Aye. A couple of liquor, a handful of liquor licenses now. So uh, the first is for the Belmont Gallery of Art for a one day liquor license for the uh, purpose of hosting an art reception. Nobody here? We have three. I'm the only one. Okay. <laughs> um, well, then I would move to approve the request from the Belmont Gallery of Art for a one-day liquor license, wine and malt only, for the purpose of hosting an art reception on Friday, January 24th, 2020, from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. at the Belmont Gallery of Art. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Excellent. All right. And it looks like, are you Laura? I am. Would you please join us? And we have a, another request from uh, patrons, uh, Belmont Performing Arts, for a one-day liquor license for the purpose of hosting it. <laughs> a trivia night fundraiser. I, I love this, pro this. I've made every one of these. Yes, you have. Uh, this will be our fourth year. My name is Laura Wenzel. I should introduce myself. I'm the treasurer of patrons of Belmont Performing Arts. And we exist uh, solely to support the theater department at the high school. Um, and this was intended originally as a social 
for the adults in the community to support the theater department mm -hmm. also to socialize. But it's turned into a minor fundraiser because we have so many wonderful donations from the community of, um, of wine, of beer, of food, of other things. So we've, we have a trivia, we decided to have an activity instead of just socializing, socializing and it's trivia night as you've participated in. And there are tables of six to eight people. You can, we will assign you to a team or you can bring your team and it's competitive but nicely competitive. <laughs> it's competitive, <laughs> yeah. I gotta say, it's pretty competitive. We came in second one year, I think, we actually won the, the, you win, you get tickets to the, um, the, the high school's musical <laughs> show. Reserve seats. Well, reserve seats. Reserve seats. And yeah. we actually got them because the winning team was actually the teachers and they couldn't take the prize. <laughs> <laughs> so we came in second place and got the prize. But the, this was years ago and then the other years we keep falling every year or lower in the rankings for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> it's really hard. It's, it's it fun is. though. It's How really many participants do you typically get? Um, 125 and it's at the Beach Street Center February 7th. No, people should go. It's a, it's a, whether you mm -hmm. have anyone involved in the performing arts in Belmont or not, it's still a, it's a great social evening. Yeah, and Terrific. tickets are available on the uh, Belmont High School website. There's a link to our, to our organization, to patrons. Awesome. So thank you for your consideration. Absolutely. Se seems straightforward and everything looks to be in order. I would move to approve the request from the patrons of Belmont Performing Arts for a one-day liquor license, wine and malt only, for the purpose of hosting a trivia night fundraiser to be benefit the Belmont High School Theater Department on Friday, February 7th, 2020, from the hours of 6.30 to 10 p.m. at the Beach Street Center. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Looking forward to it. Okay, a, uh, another request for a liquor license. And nobody is here for it, but this nobody looks like a fairly for. straightforward one as well. And I will, as a member of the U Church, I will recuse myself from this. Oh. I, I will still move to approve the request from the First Church in Belmont UU for a one-day liquor license, wine and malt only for the purpose of hosting a fundraiser auction for the church on Saturday, February 8th, 2020, or snow date of Sunday, February 9th, 2020, from 5.30 p.m. till 10 p.m. at the First Church, 404 Concord Ave in Belmont. Um, Second. All in favor? Aye. And one recusal. One, one recusal. All right, next up is a <coughs> discussion and check in on the FY21 budget schedule, which I think Patrice is passing around. Yeah, this, I would say there's really no update. It's just a kind of a reminder and an overview of F FY21 budget process and, and kind of where we want to go. Um, once the formal budget is distributed, which will be after the joint meeting or right before, which is February 10th, um, then it's the subcommittee for the Warren Committee is doing their, their work. You, you met. Um, with boards, um, what, what was that, October? I think it was October. Something yeah. October, yeah, it seems like ages ago. I mean, nothing's yeah. really changed on the town side of the budget. I don't know if you want to bring it back. That was my budget. question. Do we need to bring, like, I don't think it do. takes time out of their day. I don't nothing's want to waste really the department heads' right. time unless there's something to discuss. Unless you, there's something specific. Unless something to. dramatically changed, but, the, but we've a, I've asked all my questions I had of it, unless something really nothing uh, different. Changed. Are the draft budgets any different now than what they were in October? No. I don't see the need to drag them back I, in, unless I, I, like I on a case agree. by case, one department has some thing to talk about. Right. We're yeah, also I'm doing work with the financial task yeah, force. Yeah, I was going to say, we'll talk a little bit more about the financial task force, I think, in the TA report. Yep. And there's some interaction with the departments there that in some cases, potentially, we may want them to come and talk about some of their five-year yes. plans. Correct. Um, but I think, at least I would agree at this stage, I don't know that we need to bring them back just to talk about And they're also going to be meeting problems. with the Capital Budget Committee, one on, you know, department by department, right. so I, you know, I get to keep an eye on their time. Understood, agreed. So really we're just wrapping up the budget and getting it into a nice package form and then s submitting it to, to all the boards and teams. And we've been, I mean, I know you've been uh, working closely with the school, with Tony Pataligero mm -hmm. and Superintendent Phelan to make sure that they are integrated yep. into this process and we have every reason to believe the tenth we will have a date. town budget going forward on the 10th, right? Yes, that is the date. Excellent. February 10th? February 10th. All right. Mm. I have it. You don't need any votes? Nope. Okay, I guess. Yeah, it's February 10th, did, is that? It's, I have it in my calendar. Did you send that pin right now? Yeah, I thought Pam did. Now that we're thinking, now that yeah, I have it. So someone did. <laughs> so someone, someone got it. February 10th. Correct. Are we doing that here? Yes. Well, actually, you know what? I was thinking about the Beach Street Center. It might be a little larger to accommodate all the, because we usually kind of cramp. Well, we have a light board meeting at 6, so we need to, whatever, we can move them both. Right. I mean, we've done that before. Just yep. We're usually very cramped. 
Yeah, so and, just and let can, us know. We can get uh, video at the Peachtree Center, correct? Yes. It should be okay. Yeah. And I have to see if it's available. Which you might yeah. Have. Well, yeah. That might not be a bad idea though, because it does feel a little bit cramped in, in here. And we put the big table down. Yeah, the exactly. Yeah. I think it's that's probably a good idea if you can do it. All right, let's keep moving. Um, <coughs> committee appointments to the Age Friendly Advisory Council. We are ahead of schedule, by the way. Oh, let's goodness, do that. that is good work. Must be the cold. Uh, I don't know. If you would introduce, if you would not in, on introducing uh, yourself, John. Uh, John Marshall, Assistant Town Administrator. So um, the last time we brought this committee in front of the board, uh, several appointments were made. Uh, there are three appointments still to be made. Uh, and I think we got an update just as of uh, before the meeting tonight. There are three candidates to review uh, as well for tonight. So it sounds like we can wrap this up tonight. Yeah, so, look. so you, you, you gave us an additional. Uh, yep. There's a third. There's a yeah, third applicant. Correct. So the, this is the one that was yeah, in that you just handed us a minute ago. Yep. Okay. Great. Sam Pesto. So the three candidates are uh, Timothy Flood, Beverly Freeman, and the latest applicant uh, Ellen Eileen. Tell. Uh, sorry, Eileen Tell. Tell. Eileen Tell. Excellent. And we're looking to appoint three. Correct. Correct. So I think this is fairly straightforward. Yeah, they all seem to be. I mean, not qualified and engaged. Then Nava right. recommended the two that had come in in advance, but since uh, Eileen's hadn't come in in time, Nava hadn't weighed in. But I mean, Eileen's clearly qualified. But Eileen definitely great. looks like the reader background. She's a senior expert. So. Yeah. So, the only question I had is uh, in the charge for appointments, it says four residents with one specializing in ADA compliance. Is, is that a um, is that a requirement or a it's preference? It's a good it's question. A preference. I think when you spoke about it, it was more of a preferred. Because I, I don't see that any of the three candidates are really specialists. In well, Nava Flood. said Tim Flood was. I don't know what where that comes from. Yeah, but I, it's, what he it's, said. Not, it's not, well, if ADA compliance, not sure exactly what that I entails, but I, yeah, I don't It's not really that. a certification per se, right? So I think it's. Knowledge. Uh, someone sorry. with disability. Well, it says Tim Flood has a background with disability services. I mean, I. Well, I, I don't know where it comes from, but if it's just a preference, I think we could give it a try. Well, I guess the, the main issue is uh, one reason to form this council is, is so they could have a report by March 14th so that we could qualify potentially for some grants. And Correct. I guess the main thing is to be sure that the composition of the committee is of the council is one that will allow us to qualify for the grants. And if that's the case with these three, then I think we're good. Yeah. I, I believe you were fine. I think the ADA was all, I thought that was from your discussions of who you wanted on the committee. Well, if Nava, if Nava was comfortable with it, I'm, I mean, she's in the field, I'm comfortable yeah. with it. But it's a point well taken. I get it. Okay. We, we have three openings and three applicants. I don't know what else to say. Well, well especially, <laughs> well, if it turns out that the ADA compliance is our own criterion, then we can waive it. If, and it's a fuzzy criteria. Yeah. And this is a more of an ad hoc committee, which will probably end. It's a one. It's a one-year term, so I don't. Yep. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm I guess the only thing then, so since March 14th is coming up quickly, is this has this council met yet? It sounds like they have a quorum technically at this point. I, we'd have to ask Nava. I'm not sure. Okay, but uh, are they clear? I think on we what? you appointed them last time, so they could start to meet. Well, okay. yeah. well, let's load them up and see what they do. So are they are they clear on what the action plan needs to do? Nava is yes. Well, I would move right. to appoint uh, Bev Freeman, Tim Flood, and Eileen Tell to the Age-Friendly Belmont Advisory Committee. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. For the one-year term. Excellent. Despite yeah, they're all they're one-year one term. I'm just making so it, just to be clear. Well, I think that's clear. All right. Patrice, we have our TA report. Yes, thank you. So the planning board is holding its first public meeting on the McLean property development presented to the board in November. I've attached the plan and the schematics. On Tuesday, January 21st at 7 p.m., I will be in attendance at this meeting to determine what the best course of action is moving forward. The board will need to review the proposed zoning as well as deliberate any service impact to the town. So that will be ongoing mm -hmm. once the planning board does its work. Now that the RFP for the ice skating rink has been voted and released, there needs to be a discussion on the process of review for respondents. Attached is a list of people that were part of the internal working group that helped draft the RFP. I'm looking for feedback from the board as to who should be represented on the reviewing committee 
Again, want to thank Glenn Clancy, John Marshall, and Jeffrey Wheeler for all their hard work on the RFP. Where's the I, oh, there it is. I will note this was a particularly good group. It was kind of an informal group that came together, but uh, it was a, a, a pretty, I'd say, a pretty effective group. It hits all the notes. I yep. mean, I, I don't have any reason to think of anyone else. Okay. Um, I was going to share this with um, the superintendent and, and see if the school committee agrees, and then we have consensus, and then once we get the responses in, we can get this group together and start reviewing All these people are willing to do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, we should check back and make sure everyone's willing to do it. Yep. And I do think we should uh, be a little bit more clear about what the timeline, and timeline's there, but specifically what's involved in each step in the timeline and when we want to get materials to people and what we're asking them to do, because yep. right now it's kind of a 40,000 foot yes. uh, level as opposed to the specifics of how we get this done. Uh, okay. That's great. Uh, the Financial Task Force is meeting to determine the operating override scheduled for the fall of 2020. The committee is requesting an agenda item be placed on the select board and school committee agendas going forward uh, so that the residents can be informed of the override process. There has been a lot of feedback from residents on their recent tax bills and how their properties are being assessed in town. We have invited the Board of Assessors to your February 3rd meeting to discuss how values are determined. I'm also going to work with the town assessor to generate a Q&A sheet that explains to residents how values are determined and taxes are assessed in town. I think that's important. And we're, and we're trying to figure out ways to get that sheet out there, right? I mean, yeah. we certainly want to publish it on the, the website, but there was a discussion as to whether or not it goes in the next tax bill. You know, do we somehow leverage Belmont Lights distribution? Uh, I think there was, uh, at least within the most recent financial task force uh, group, a sort of growing awareness that the most recent round of tax bill really did kind of shake the bushes a little bit. And people are expressing concerns about valuations, tax increases. It's the first tranche of borrowing uh, from the debt exclusion that's now hitting their bills. And there seems to be a kind of a, a, a growing awareness of the tax burden. So trying to get out there with education as much as we can in the next couple of months as a foundation for what will ultimately be very likely an override conversation with them. Can, can we post on Nextdoor? There's, there's so much discussion of this issue on Nextdoor. I'm sure I can find a millennial that I, works. Well, we should, actually, we, should talk, we should talk about that at some point. Maybe one of the agenda items we can pick up in the next meeting is how we think about social media and how we think about engaging in social media. Yep. Uh, there have been many a Facebook conversation that I have witnessed where you know, you're 30 comments into the thread, and if someone authoritatively had just posted after the first comment with a link to the answer, it would have taken the whole thread down to you know zero. So, so you don't want us tweeting a bunch of all caps misspelled things. Out yeah. there. <laughs> I think we should figure out how to do it. I mean, every one of us is a member of the community and is welcome to post, but I yeah, think yeah, there's yeah. some value yeah. in us figuring out how do we want to approach this? Do we specifically look to someone in the town administrator's office to be you know, the person to do this, because I think yeah, next door, Facebook, they all have these situations. It's kind of least resistance if the discussions are taking place on yeah. forums like next door, then yeah. if we could post there, it would be the most direct path. It can be very yeah. frustrating to look at the comments when you know that the, some of them are just wrong. Yes, um, but exactly. Yeah. So, Patricia, I don't know, if you, would you mind, could we put that on an uh, upcoming sure. agenda and kind of talk through how we want to... Did you get a recommendation, yeah. maybe? Sure. Put, yeah. Yeah. yeah we ha I, I've got some ideas. I'm happy to chat with you, Patrice, and we can figure out how to put a recommendation forward. Sure. Week. Can I make one other comment about the financial task force? Oh, yeah, Just, yeah, yeah. Uh, So uh, also to be clear, and I think Patrice has this, but in an effort to continue the education process, uh, if this group <laughs> is amenable, wanted to have a standing item on the, on the select board agenda that would you know, provide a five-minute, three-minute, whatever is necessary update on where we are in the process sure. every single week. Good. School committee would do the same thing. I think we have to start educating uh, the community about sort of where we are and the process that we're undertaking. And what, what's their target date? What's the financial task force uh, force's target date for having a finished report? So the finished report will be probably this summer. Um, I'd say there's two milestones worth noting. One is in late February, we anticipate having late February, early March, a five-year projected kind of model that we look forward to bringing to this group and a number of other stakeholders to get comments and feedback on, on that. And that will include, uh, we're trying to figure out exactly how to do it, but ultimately it would include a kind of level services budget, um, which again is not level funding, but level services, as well as a version of that model that includes the various different asks that uh, department
department have about kind of how they, in, in the event of a successful override, might want to provide incremental services to the community. So we're trying to gather both of those things so that we can have a conversation about uh, where, the, where the needs are, where the requests are, um, and then also put that in the context of, you know, ultimately the decision we're going to have to make is to how big will that override be and what do we think we can afford. Mm. So that, that late February, early March, we mm -hmm. should have that conversation. Yep. And Correct. then um, the other milestone, of course, would be town meeting where financial task force will provide another update to town meeting. Um, I expect the report will not be done then, but we'll be at a phase where we're making uh, some, uh, providing some, some updates on kind of process and, and ultimately getting to the point where the select board has to make a decision in what time frame on the November? Is it it's sometime in the summer? We need to figure out how big the override would be yes. and request that the. I think we're wonder we're before everyone kind of leaves. So yeah. we have to put things on the ballot though far enough. It's, it's surprisingly yeah. early, given that it's a, it's a presidential the deadline. Election. Is yeah. August or September? Yeah, yeah I think ballot. that's I think that's right. It's August. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah, it was sometime. But in we also have to summer. reach out to the legislature and get permission to have the local question on the federal ballot. So. There's a whole process. That we There's a whole process, and you know the plan is to obviously bring this group in. We have to bring the warrant committee, the school committee, the capital budget committee. There's a lot that's going to happen in the kind of March, April, May time frame to start to get everybody more and more aware of the work that's that's underway. Thank you for allowing as me to. As long as we yeah. I, I make sure we get those commentary. date specifics, we don't blow any of them. Yes. That's important. So. Um, a capital budget was distributed to the capital budget committee, warrant committee member, and select board members. This is the work that John Marshall and I took up with the department heads to determine capital needs for 2021. I wanted to thank John for all his hard work taking this, taking on this challenge. The document has been submitted to the Capital Budget Committee for their review. So this is just our work and our recommendation on capital. Obviously, yeah. it's the Capital Budget Committee that takes that. And, yeah, and the Capital Budget Committee had a meeting. Uh, John attended. We went through the book. It's got a new format, but it's great. And we laid out a schedule for where we're going to be meeting with department heads and interviewing about capital projects. So it is begun. It has begun. Yep. Excellent. And that concludes the report. Oh, well, the February 10th already. Yep. Yep. Okay. Terrific. All right. So I think we have got committee liaison reports and then some minutes to approve. So uh, committee liaison reports. Just told you capital budget committee, so there's nothing else other than that. Uh, the public meeting for the community path, which was originally intended to be January, is slipping. And um, that date may not be until late February or possibly March due to um, uh, delays in getting a necessary meetings with the MBTA for the consultant to be able to present uh, a more fleshed out proposal in, in, the, con in the course of the meeting. Okay. Does that likely delay the ultimate construction? Well. Or is there well, more like getting the on not, the, not the, on the bid. Well, the meeting we had last week, um, the, the they confirmed that their uh, intent certainly is to have 25 percent design completed by late spring, early summer. So, you know, hopefully this all comes together. But this is becoming more and more challenging. So we'll make sure we don't miss the funding. Then. Well, the, the funding. No, we won't. The actual funding decision is quite off in the future, but it's in order to keep on the path, we need oh. to. Okay. But, but there's a lot of stuff you have to do before that. And <laughs> Is one large? Uh, but it's, <laughs> but the, at this point, uh, <laughs> the slide is too warm for January. Yeah. Uh, in any event, uh, the, there are a lot of, uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, the, the MBTA is, is the key actor at this point, and yep. uh, we can't really proceed until the MBTA gives us some guidance. If I kill this on camera, is that okay? Yes. I, I'm not going to say yes to that. Maybe you kill it. All right. <laughs> uh, got minutes. <laughs> All right. Uh. All right. Sorry about that. <laughs> 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 All right, so uh, one other update. I um, yeah. <laughs> high, high school, uh, middle and high school building committee um, continues to uh, uh, kind of meet regularly. Uh, there's a great deal of construction underway right now. And <laughs> it's, uh, it's pretty remarkable. Can you um, hear gen it? Can you hear? Generally speaking, we, uh, uh, the project is on uh, pace, on uh, the pace that they want to be on, which is good. Uh, early February will be an important milestone. We're now at a point where everything has been put out to bid, or nearly everything, and we will be looking
looking at bids that will come back in early February. And at that point, we'll have a sense as to whether or not we are, in fact, going to be able to hit the budget. Um, so that will be a pretty significant, uh, uh, pretty significant meeting in, uh, in early February. But right now, you know, what you want at this stage is a lot of uh, groups interested in bidding. And um, you know, the team's done a very, very good job of getting out there and, again, sort of shaking the bushes and, uh, and bringing people to the table that intend to submit uh, bids. So I think everyone's at this stage pretty optimistic. Oh, and I, I should add regarding the uh, DPW that uh, the original schedule was for that work to be finished in early December, but the um, contractor suffered the most unbelievable series of really grievous family tragedies that uh, slowed them down, and it's a miracle that they have come through that. But our owner's project manager, Daedalus, provided just an invaluable service in um, overseeing the project when the general manager, the general contractor himself was unable to really work for family reasons. And uh, the goal now is to have substantial completion later this month. Excellent. Okay. Right. And it's slightly behind schedule, but it's on budget. So it'll be very good when it's all done. Super. Excellent. And the police station is? Uh, steady as she grows. Uh, <laughs> but you know, that, that's going to be an 18-month project. But it's, it's all proceeding smoothly. Great. Other updates? All right, let's keep moving. I guess we've got two minutes to approve. Both look fine to me. I didn't see anything either. Wait. Quick review. Uh, yeah. I'll move approval of the October 31st, 2019 regular meeting minutes and the December 18th, 2019 regular meeting minutes. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, and a motion to adjourn. Uh, move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, 8.30.